Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and watching KMCC's online service today. We just want to thank you for joining us. Also, if you are new with us and you don't necessarily attend our church and you're just watching us online, thank you for joining us. That's awesome. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, there's a really easy way to do that. You just visit kmcc.org, click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the page, and there will be a digital connect card for you to fill out. And that will email us, and we'll be able to pray with you, um, get in contact with you, whatever you would like. Um, and we can uh, get to know you a little bit better. Also, if you would like to give online, if you would still like to give your offering, if you are a regular attender, um, you can also give online at our homepage on our website, so kmcc.org, and then you're going to click the, home, or the Give button on the homepage, and then you can give online that way. Otherwise, thank you so much again for tuning in and enjoy our online service. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this Easter Sunday. Why don't you guys worship with us this morning as we praise our risen Savior. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Praise His name for. 
Through the darkness 
you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we celebrate you today, our resurrected King. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you. And as much as we long to be together with our beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, I'm just so thankful to you that we have the freedom today to broadcast the miracle of your resurrection, Lord, and the great power that you have. Father, and I just thank you that we can praise you where we are together. And Lord, for someone who maybe is, it's the first time of hearing about you, Lord, I just pray that this message today impacts their hearts, Lord, that they would call and want to know more about you and your love. And Father, today, I just we just thank you and celebrate the Redeemer that you are, our Rescuer, Lord. And Father, I just pray that <clears throat> you would take captive our thoughts, Lord, that they would be obedient to your word, Lord, to your promises. I thank you that your truth is always revealed in your word, Lord. And Father, that sometimes we need to be reminded of that, sometimes a million times a day. But Father, I thank you that every second spent in your courts, Lord, is so much better than a thousand elsewhere. And Father, as we worship you with our voices, I pray that it's just a sweet sound to you. And Father, I pray your blessing on the message that Pastor Jason has today, Lord. And I pray your blessing on our offering, Lord. I thank you that we have an opportunity to give back a portion to you, the one who gave it all. Lord, we ask your blessing on that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Good morning, KMCC. I'm so glad that you could join us for this Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Praise God, he is risen. He is risen indeed. I think I may have heard a few of you out there. Awesome, amen. It's glad that you would I'm glad that you would join us today. And I'm so excited to speak to you this morning and bring you a message of hope, a message of joy, a message of life. Lately, we've heard nothing but messages of death and fear and hopelessness. We need this story of resurrection like no, no other time before. Today is we're going to talk about the fact that life doesn't end at the tomb. Today we're going to talk about the fact that life doesn't end in a tomb. So let me set the stage again with the story. So Jesus was murdered before their very eyes. He had been buried hurriedly without going through the proper procedures. Everything had happened so fast. One minute they were eating the Passover meal with Jesus, and the next they knew he was dead. The disciples and the other followers of Jesus had quietly and inconspicuously worked their way back to the prearranged, unobtrusive meeting spot in the corner of Jerusalem. It wasn't a big room, so everyone was kind of in everyone else's space. The last verse in Luke chapter 23 says that they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. As was their custom and their law, they sat all day together in that room. Some people were dozing, some were crying quietly in the corner. Others were staring off into space. I'm sure minds were racing. The air was thick, there were sobs. Oh my, Jesus is dead. There was anger, that betrayer Judas, if I could just get my hands on him now. There was frustration. Oh, those unjust and evil and horrible religious leaders. They put to death an innocent man, a righteous man. It was unlawful for them to do that. Their fear filled the air, making it heavy. Fear was driving their decisions. Fear of leaving the room and being killed like Jesus. Fear of staying home, staying in the room, and having the authorities find them and kill them. Fear of the fact that they had lost their jobs, or left their jobs for, to follow him and their income, all for him. And now he was dead. And now they had nothing. What homes could they go back to? 
And now there was the, gov- the Roman government breathing down their necks as well. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? We are stuck. We are doomed. They fitfully fall asleep, many not even until the wee hours of the morning. A few of the women, sick of having their minds racing all night, decide to get up and go do something about it. They went to the tomb and they found a stone. And this is our first point for today. They went to the tomb. Verses 1 through 3 of chapter 24 in the Gospel of Luke. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So the Sabbath is over. At the break of dawn, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and some other women bravely head off to the tomb. It's a wonderful trait that women are often the bravest among us. And these women made up their minds. Fear is not going to stop them from doing what needed to be done. It is not against the law to honor the dead. No Roman soldiers better cross their path this morning. Nothing was going to stop them from honoring the body of Jesus. Smoke was curling up out of the homes that, where people were waking up as they hurried through the streets of Jerusalem. A few people stepped out of their front doors to stretch and check the sky to see what the weather was going to be like as the, whisp, as the women whisper quietly as they go by. And they say, how, how are we going to move that stone? Stink, we should have brought a few of those snoring fishermen to do the grunt work. And they arrive at the tomb and then they gasp. The stone is already rolled away. What? Did the fishermen already arrive? Did someone steal the body? Why would anyone steal the body? Did they move the body to another place? Did the owner of the tomb just change his mind? What is going on? Why can't anything seem to be going right? I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated. I'm so sad. How am I feeling? I'm fine. I'm freaked out. I'm insecure. I'm neurotic. And I'm emotional. That was funny, by the way. While they were standing there in a daze, trying to figure out what to do next, they are confronted with two men in dazzling apparel. And these were angels, you know, like Thor, except bigger, and shining brightly. There isn't simply a halo over their head. They are shining from head to toe. And the women had two responses. Let's look at verses 4 through 7. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? So they were perplexed. Perplexed means to be at a loss or to be in doubt. Doubt. Jesus had foretold his death and his resurrection at least three times during the course of his ministry. Each synoptic gospel writer recorded it three times in each of their gospels. There was Matthew, Mark, and Luke all do that. Jesus had specifically told them that he would rise on the third day. However, these women either doubted or they forgot, or maybe a combination of both or they would not have gone to the tomb. The women went to the tomb. They were searching for someone who was dead. They were going through the rituals of grief, trying to accept the reality of Jesus' death. Death of their beloved friend, son, and teacher. Death of their hopes and dreams. And the disciples, they stayed in Jerusalem in the upper room, holding up so not, as not to draw attention to themselves. I would suspect that they did not want to receive the same fate that Jesus did. They were trying to process the death of their teacher. Now what? All that he taught us, is it really true? All of that power, why didn't he use it? And then where do we go? Back to Galilee? Even if they remembered Jesus saying that he was going to go back to Galilee, 
they probably forgot or they probably thought, well, they're probably going to kill us or run us out of town if we go back there. Stay in Jerusalem, we're just going to be hunted. Go to a new town, we'll have to start from scratch. New customers, new partners, new businesses, new jobs. Sounds like a lot of work. So they doubted and they had despair. There was loss and they were stuck in a room. They did not know where to go or what to do. Is this really how it was supposed to end? In death? He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He demonstrated power over sickness and disease and deformity and demons and storms and the sea. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. And they quarantined themselves to an upper room. They worried about going out. Their doubts grew and despair and depression set in while they stayed inside. If Jesus would not have risen, the memory of his life would have died out. The women went to the tomb expecting the body to be there. The woman went to the tomb expecting to look inside and see darkness and death. Instead, they found no body. They were confronted with life and with light. And they were frightened. They were terrified. They were trembling with fear. They were not expecting to see men or angels in dazzling, illuminated clothes. They were not expecting to see light and life. They had not considered the possibility that he would rise from the dead. The angels question, why are you searching for the living among the dead? Were they really searching for the living? Well, no, not really in their minds. In their minds, they were searching for a dead body. The statement by the angels is unexpected. Why are you searching for the living among the dead? In reality, yes, they were searching for the living. They just didn't know it yet. If you are looking for someone who is alive, a tomb is not a good place to go. And then there's the angel's matter-of-fact statement. He's not here, but he has risen. I think it may have gone something like this. Why are you looking for the living in a tomb? I, we were, uh, we were looking for Jesus. He, he died. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand all of this. Well, this is a tomb. He's not here. But wait, um, what? He has risen. He's not here. And then the angels remind them of what Jesus had said. Just a week before, as he was heading into Jerusalem, Jesus had said this. Turn to Luke chapter 18, a few pages back in your Bibles. Luke 18, 31 to 34. It says this, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you heard what they said and you thought you knew what they meant, but then walking away you were like, well, that was completely unhelpful? There are times in the relationship between Jesus and the disciples where they were confused at what he said. They walked away going, well, that was just way more confusing than when we started. And this was one of those times. They all missed it. They were completely confused. The angels reminded them of the truth that Jesus spoke. The Son of Man must be delivered. What did Jesus mean by the Son of Man must be delivered? And everything written about him by the prophets must be fulfilled. Where was this written? One such place is in Isaiah. If you want to turn there, Isaiah chapter 
53. Isaiah chapter 53 was a poem about a suffering servant of the Lord, which was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And here's what it says, a portion of it. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, he was put to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. That's a sermon all in and of itself, but let me just point out a few things. One, it said that he was buried with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea, who took the body down of Jesus, was a rich man. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. So he must be delivered. He must go through what he needed to go through. He did an offering for sin. His death paid the penalty for all of our sin. He will make many to be counted righteous. Belief in him, in this story of Jesus, equals forgiveness and justification and righteousness for us. And it ends with, he makes intercession for transgressors. That's present tense. Present tense. The implication is that he doesn't stay dead. He has to rise in order to make intercession. So Jesus had to go through death and burial. It was part of God's eternal plan. And on the third day, he needed to rise. And Jesus promised that he would rise again. In order for there to be a resurrection, there had to be death and burial. And that's why all of this must happen happen. But they all missed it. And I can imagine that the women's heads were spinning now after this reminder. The pictures and the conversations and the moments and the miracles and the sayings and the situations were flooding back into their minds like a big movie collage. Even the things that had main sets were beginning to come together. Oh, he meant that he would rise from the dead. How come I didn't get that before? And so, our third point, they remembered and they returned. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 24, verses 8 and 9. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. They remembered what he said. This is so important for us. Remembering. As humans, we're so prone to forget. This is why we have calendar apps and alarms and pictures and recordings and videos and inscriptions and plaques and rings on our finger. We even have birth certificates in, in case we forget that we were born. My daughter says I need a laugh track in case, uh, just so you know when I've made a joke so that you guys can do that. But we even need reminders to laugh. We need reminders of what Jesus said. We need reminders of what Jesus did so that we return. So that we return to Jesus. So that we return to his presence. So they turned back. Their backs were to the grave. They walked back out of the garden where the tomb was located. They walked back through the streets of Jerusalem, their excitement growing with each step. They began to hurry and then to run. Their hearts were so light, the grief was gone. Their fear had dissipated. The sorrow had turned to joy and hope flooded their souls. And they rush into the room and they tell the disciples their experience. They are talking animatedly, excitedly. They're crying with joy. They're exuberant 
over what they had just seen, and they explain it all to the eleven. And here's where you think the story is going to go better. You picture an incredible reunion, joys of laughter, relieved high fives and hugs, spontaneous songs, immediate packing up of things, and heading off to Galilee. But instead, verses 10 through 12. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. It seemed to the men as an idle tale. Here you have at least five women, according to the text, all rushing in at the same time and probably all saying the same thing and they're probably all out of breath and they're all talking at the same time I know I'm imagining this a little bit but work with me here it's women after all and they're talking fast and furiously and us guys can only process one thing at a time why are they all out of breath where were why were they running why were they running home from a tomb there's so much talking going on. I can't, I can't follow any of it. I'll just wait till it's all settled down, and then I'll ask Mary what her story was and what this all, all this ruckus is about. Joanna's talking so fast. I can only pick up every third word. I heard tomb and light and spices and Jesus. Why is she so excited? And they did not believe them. In our grief and our sadness, we humans find it so difficult to believe. We see the finality of what is before us, death or loss or permanence. These things are so overwhelming that we lose hope and we don't believe that anything good could come from the situation. Or that anything good is even happening anywhere else in the world. And we forget his promises. And then we, we actually get perturbed at others who are not grieving like us who are still enjoying life. How insensitive can they be? And perhaps this is how the disciples were in this context. They were perturbed at how insensitive the women were for bursting in with this ridiculous story of Jesus rising from the dead. Perhaps this is where you are. You are concerned with what is going on in the world. You're grieving the things happening because of this virus. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you lost your business. You are worried about losing your home. You have lost family or friends. You are alone. You're holed up in your house, afraid to go out, afraid to stay at home. You are afraid to die. You're full of fear. You are stuck. And this is the reality you're in. And you might say to me, how could you be so insensitive as to talk about someone rising from the dead in this time? That doesn't happen. Stop filling people's minds with ridiculous stories, nonsense, and false hope. And my response to you is this. I get it. The disciples of Jesus were right there with you. They were stuck. They were fearful. They were saying the same things you are. How could those ladies be so insensitive as to talk about Jesus rising from the dead. That doesn't happen. Stop wasting our time with nonsense and false hope. We need to come up with a plan. To you, I'd say, hear me out for just a few more minutes. Listening to what God has to say to you in this, in this moment, this morning, could be the most important time in your life. And it says that Peter ran. The disciples thought it was nonsense, but Peter ran. He had to check it out. And I hope and pray that this is your response to Jesus' resurrection today. I pray that you run to him. Remember and return. Whether a believer in Jesus yet or not, here it is. Remember that Jesus is risen. And return to him. Run to him. Don't wait, don't hesitate, don't walk, run to him. 
And Peter ran to the tomb. It was empty. He did not see Jesus' body there either. The women were telling the truth. And Peter returned to the room marveling. He was hopeful. A few hours later, Jesus appeared to the Peter and the disciples in that very room. Jesus showed up in their confinement. And they saw the risen Jesus with their own eyes. Peter, who had denied him, saw Jesus firsthand. He saw Jesus in his body. Alive and well. He had seen him die just a few days before, and now he sees him alive. Life had ended, had not ended in the tomb. It did not end in the tomb. Because Jesus was alive, fear was gone, hope flooded in, and life had purpose again. Today, if you have not placed your faith in the risen Lord Jesus, then I urge you to do so at this moment. We can see in our world right around us right now, none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Life doesn't end in a tomb. We go on living in our bodies after we die. It is just a matter of where we will be. Will we be with God in his presence, in a new heaven and a new earth, with no more pain and death? Or will we be apart from God and his presence, in an eternal place filled and ruled by pain and death. The choice is up to you. Don't be like the disciples whose first response was to think this story of Jesus rising from the dead was an idle tale and a heap of nonsense. Listen, I know this story can sound ludicrous, even foolish. If this is how you feel about it, you are actually not alone. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, that the Corinthian church said this. He said, The message of the cross, this story of Jesus dying and rising from the dead, is foolishness to those who do not believe. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. I urge you to trust Jesus. Believe in him today, and you will find that this story has incredible, incredible power. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. In 24 hours, you could be struggling for air and burning a fever. You could have a heart attack. You could suffer a car accident. You don't know, so don't delay. If you need more information or you just want to talk it through, email me. Call me. Contact us through the website. Talk to that person who invited you to listen in online. Do whatever it takes, but do it today. If you have already placed your faith in Jesus, my word to you is be encouraged. Because he lives, you, like the disciples, can face tomorrow. The only change in the disciples' situation was that Jesus was now alive. The religious leaders were still angry. Satan still thought that he had won. The Romans still occupied the land. People were still getting sick. People were still dying. Fear still filled the land. They were still in the room. But when he appeared to them, and they believed that he was alive, everything changed. Because Jesus was alive, fear was gone. Hope flooded in, and life had purpose again. And it is the same for us. We are still holed up in our homes. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. World leaders are still doing their things. Loved ones are still getting sick. People are still dying. News feeds are still propagating fear. But Jesus is alive. And this fact makes all the difference. Because we need not fear life or death. Jesus has conquered it all. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our life. Jesus is our purpose. Purpose. Death is defeated. Our sin is forgiven. We are eternally secure in God's loving care. We are children of God. We are members of his family, the church. We are loved with an everlasting and unbreakable and unshakable love. We, when we die, not if, when we die, 
we will be raised to newness of life, just like Jesus. Because he lives, we have a future waiting for us in heaven, in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No more pain, no more sickness, no more death, and no more fear. Remember and trust his promises. Praise God, life doesn't end in a tomb. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for the hope that it brings us. Thank you for the confidence that it can give us. Thank you that it can relieve our fears. Because Jesus rose, we know that we have life in our futures. We don't have to be filled with fear today. Lord God, fill us with confidence in your word, hope in Jesus, peace in our future, and joy in our present circumstances. God, help us to rest in the fact that Jesus is risen and that in rising, he defeated death. God, if there's people that need to turn to you and put their faith in Jesus, I pray that you would work on their hearts right now. Call them to yourself and may they cross that line and put their trust in the only one that can bring them hope and joy and life. And that is Jesus. We thank you that we can rest in him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Now I want you to receive this benediction from the Lord, and it's based on Isaiah chapter 43. Fear not, do not be afraid, for Jesus has redeemed you. He has called you by name. You are his. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, he will be with you. When you pass through the rivers of doubt and despair, they will not overwhelm you. For he is the Lord your God and your Savior, and he has overcome. Amen. God bless you. He is risen. Thank you so much again for joining us for this online service. Just a reminder, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the little notification bell down there um, right next to the subscribe button, and you'll get notified when we upload new videos or when we premiere more services. That's it. Thank you again for joining us, and tune in next time.